in Ireland, this is like shocking. Uh, in Ireland, um, the person, the woman who gives birth to the child is considered their mother. Now, our service has no genetic relationship to our children because we used a different egg donor. But what's more, more shocking for us is that because our surrogate is married, her husband is considered their father in Irish law. That's bonkers. Yeah. He may never have even met the babies. Hello and welcome to The Mothership, Ireland's first parenting panel show, brought to you by herfamily.ie. I'm Laura Cunningham and in the coming weeks, we'll be bringing all of the issues that affect Irish families to this table. Today's topic is one I'm very pleased to lend our voice to. I'm a mother, I have a son that I absolutely adore, and the idea that in some situation I could be not considered his mother is really difficult to fathom and unfortunately, that's a situation that many Irish families are now facing because of the current lack of legislation for families created via surrogacy abroad or for donor assisted conception. Joining us today is founder and CEO of Equality for Children, Renee Von Medic. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Cathy Wheatley, who represents the advocacy group Irish Families Through Surrogacy. Hi. And their fellow activist and father of two, Brendan Spratt. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, you guys are all fighting for the rights of, of children and fighting for equality, but you're also parents. And this issue has affected you all um, in a very different ways. Cathy, we're going to go to you first. Tell us about your surrogacy journey. How did you come to it? And, you know, what does the current situation mean for you and your family? Yeah, I suppose for us, um, our surrogacy journey came about through tra tragedy, like like a lot of couples um, who start off. So we um, got married in 2013. Uh, that Christmas, we moved into our house and I found out that I was pregnant. Um, and all I've ever wanted to be was a mother. So that news was the best news we could ever have. Um, and still to this day, the favourite time I had in my life was when I was pregnant, when I was carrying our baby. Um, unfortunately for us, it didn't work out the way it was supposed to, like lots of other families in Ireland. Um, and um, at seven months pregnant, I had a spontaneous uterine rupture, um, went to the hospital um, and unfortunately, the care that I received was substandard and there was failures in my care in the hospital. It was around the time that all the regional hospital scandals was breaking about failures in maternity care. Um, and we were one of those families that was caught up in that issue. Um, and so for me, um, that day I lost her precious daughter, baby Helen. Um, and I also lost the real possibility of having a family because my uterus was so badly damaged to carry a pregnancy myself was was never going to be an option again. Of course, you don't want to accept that and you go down all other routes and try and think that can't be the case, um, you know, especially when all you've ever wanted to be is a mother um, and to have a family. And so, you know, after, I suppose, taking some time to come to terms with what happened, um, what I always say is I had a choice at that point to get bitter or get better. Um, and for me, I wanted to get better and what that looked like to me was for us to have a family to love and nurture. With Helen, I suppose, giving me the strength to go forward, we started to look at how we were going to create our family. Um, and having exhausted all other options, like most couples in that situation, um, especially for us, surrogacy was because of a medical condition. So we see surrogacy as being a medical treatment to a medical condition. Um, and so we looked at, at various options about where we could go. And there was Canada, America, the Ukraine. Um, and at the time, really, the Ukraine was the only option financially open to us. Um, we were very lucky in the fact that the Ukraine was open to us because the Ukraine as a country is only open to heterosexual married couples, um, which isn't right, obviously. Um, but for us, we fitted into that category. Um, and so it was the place that we could go. So we went ahead and started our surrogacy journey. Um, thankfully for us, it worked out and we met our beautiful surrogate, Ivana. And uh, she looked after our babies. And that was the point, we had babies. So we had twins. So um, in November, 2019, Ted and Elsie were born through surrogacy. Um, we were there in the hospital. Um, Ivan had to have a C-section and so they were brought into us afterwards. And so we saw Ted and Elsie still pinch myself at that time that you realise that these are your living, breathing babies. And I suppose for us as well, I just kept saying over and over, they're alive, they're alive, because my reality was 
that yeah. that 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 wasn't the case. So when when they were born and, and they were here and, and 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 they were perfect, I I honestly couldn't. Uh, it was literally like my life had purpose again. Um, and so I say to my family and to everybody really that you know in the normal society way I didn't give Ted and Elsie life but they gave me life and they gave me a life to be able to lead um, and to to build together as a family and so we are absolutely honoured to get to be their parents. And they're the most beautiful kids. So tell us when you came home from Ireland as a family how how did things ch- things change here? Yeah, I suppose the things changed instantly the minute that we landed in Dublin Airport. Um, one of my favourite memories of coming home is there's a picture. It was Christmas time. We came home on, on the 8th of December and my husband's a farmer and that was traditionally farmer shopping day. And so, <laughs> you know, there was a large crowd in Dublin Airport. I don't know if that was why, but no, no. Uh, they all came up to greet Ted Nelsey. So all of our families were there, uh, extended wow. families, aunts, uncles, cousins. It was absolutely amazing and uh, I came came through you know and it, it was it was definitely one of my happiest moments as I came through and we had our babies and they were home and all our family were there to greet them but now when I look back at that picture I realized that that was the moment that I lost the right to be their mother um, and so it's tinged with sadness for me it definitely is because in the Ukraine I'm on Ted and Elsie's birth certificate I'm their mother when I landed in Ireland, I'm no longer recognised as their mother. So who are their legal parents under Irish law? Under Irish law, Keith is their legal father. Okay. So true DNA evidence that you do over in the Ukraine. So when, when we're in the Ukraine after they're born, um, Ted and Elsie get a DNA test. Uh, Keith gets a DNA test and Ivana, our surrogate, gets a DNA test as well. Um, Ivana proves that she's a gestational carrier. She has uh, no relationship genetically to the children. Um, and so the DNA tests are all done and dusted there. We come back and then we go through the court system here in Ireland. Okay. And Keith applies um, to be uh, for a declaration of parentage um, singly by himself for the children. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. So, so are you a legal guardian? No. So uh, you have to wait until you've cared for the children for two years to oh, apply right. to be a legal guardian, um, I suppose to prove that you can do it maybe, I don't know. Um, and where does that leave you? I know it's it, there are certain legal vulnerabilities. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, like just recently, and um, I, I've spoke about this in terms of Elsie had pneumonia and um, we were going to the hospital. Um, and obviously because of COVID, only one parent is allowed in mm. with the child. And that couldn't be me. Oh, wow. And it, it's not so much that it couldn't be me as in, I trust the medical profession that they're going to do the right thing for, 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 for children and, and for us. But in my head, the anxiety that I had over me going in there and not legally being able to sign any document for her filled me with so much fear that I was like, how, how can I do this? I can't, I need to send in her legal parent who's mm-hmm. her much loved daddy. Um, but at the end of the day, I was in the car park, sitting in the car, crying with him video calling me and Elsie just calling for her mommy. And whichever parent that is, that you can't be there. No. You know. So your husband has more rights to your children than you do, essentially. I have absolutely no rights none. to my children, none whatsoever. And where would that leave you if, God forbid, anything happened to either of you? So, um, first of all, if, if anything happened to Keith right now, I'm not the kid's legal guardian. Um, if uh, in the future I became their legal guardian, um, I, I would have them legally until they're 18. But after that, I'm not recognised as being their parent. Um, as everybody knows, you don't give up being a parent when your kids reach 18. If anything, that's when you need to <laughs> step up and, and do a lot for them at, at that point as well. Um, but also, I suppose, if um, if it if it happens that a declaration of parentage came in that I could be recognised as their legal parent, if Keith's not here by the time that happens, then I will never have the right to be their legal parent. And we have members of our group who are in that situation mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, and there's a cancer diagnosis and the husband is worried because if he passes away, God forbid, his child has no legal parent. This is so it's urgent for everyone, but it's especially urgent, obviously, for that family. Um, 
Brendan, you are obviously in a different situation yourself and Gavin, your husband, um, mm-hmm. had your two gorgeous kids in the States via yeah. surrogacy. Tell us all about that and where your legal standing is at the moment. Yeah, it's a similar story to Cathy's and our, our legal situation is similar, but um, I suppose it had a different start in that our surrogacy journey started very much to a point of love and uh, myself and Gavin were together for a long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got married when, after we were together nine years. We're together 16 years now. Wow. And we just had a really happy, happy life. I'd seen how much joy kids could bring to like a family and just kids can bring to people. And mm-hmm. um, so we started giving the the the, the thoughts turned to could we be a family so we really gave it a lot of thought where in Irish society I think it's almost expected mm-hmm. to get as for a straight couple to get married and have kids and a lot of people don't actually think about what having kids actually means to them mm-hmm. whereas myself and Gavin really thought about what do we have to offer do we really want to bring kids into the world and we decided yeah we have a lot to offer we have a really nice life we've done well in our careers and we knew we have a really lovely home we knew that we could we could give kids a great life um, so yeah, our only option was, as Cathy said, the Ukraine wasn't open to us. Our only option was uh, the USA or Canada. We wanted to do it uh, by the book. Like I know people are doing surrogacy in Ireland and in the UK and uh, surrogacy is happening all over the world. But for us, we wanted to do it in like in where we were very much protected as the in- intended parents and where the surrogate was going to be protected as well. So I did loads of research, months of research. And uh, um, so we, you know, I we realized that we needed three agencies to help us. We needed a surrogacy agency, Mm -hmm. then we needed an an IVF clinic, and we also needed an egg donor agency. So again, like myself and Gavin were two parents that came together. We were there right from the beginning. We did all this research together. So we were their parents together right from this, like years before they were born. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we got... Uh, we matched with a surrogacy agency and uh, they matched us with an amazing surrogate who we just clicked with immediately. Uh, so then we went about creating our embryos and then the, I'm, I'm obviously like condensing uh, years into... Sure, sure. But yeah, it is a complicated uh, journey. But yeah, our surrogate then uh, went and, uh, to the IVF clinic and they implanted an embryo and we got pregnant first time around. So uh, nine months later, we went, myself and Gavin went to Denver, Colorado and Theo was born there. Um, and then uh, uh, that, like, it was just magical. It was, it's been brilliant with Theo. And thankfully, uh, we had such a good experience. The surrogate had such a good experience with us that she offered to carry a second baby mm-hmm. for us. So Lily was born two years ago. So now we have Theo, who's four, just turned four, and Lily, who's going to be two just after Christmas. Here you have your hands full. Yes. <laughs> so tell me, um, it was done in the sense that you are uh, biologically the yeah. father of one and Gavin is biologically the father of the other, which yes. is amazing. Yes. Um, but, and in, in America, you're both their legal fathers on their birth certs. Yeah. But in Ireland, that's different. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was really important for us right from the beginning. I wanted the kids to be born in a state, in the States where the birth cert would reflect mm-hmm. their family. So delighted it, it means a lot to us that Theo it's terrible that I'm saying delighted it's like that well, you know it should that, be a given. exactly it should mm-hmm. be a given but I am the fact that Theo and Lily's birth cert says father one and mm-hmm. father two just means a lot to me that they have this piece of paper that that is their birth cert and that is what what we that is the truth the way it should be that's the way it should be but unfortunately that birth cert is not recognized in Ireland okay in Ireland this is like shocking. Uh, in Ireland, um, the person, the woman who gives birth to the child is considered their mother. Now, our surrogate has no genetic relationship to our children because we used a different egg donor. But what's more, more shocking for us is that because our surrogate is married, her husband is considered their father in Irish law. Mm-hmm. That's bonkers. Yeah. He may never have even met the babies, yeah, and no, he's yeah. a legal father. It's just it's just a, a le- it's just a minefield. You know, yeah. you're, you're opened up to a very vulnerable vulnerable position. Again, our surrogate is amazing. She's in a really content, happy marriage. Uh, her husband is is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He's he's brilliant. But you know, like it just it's a it's a ridiculous legal like situation. And so, what have in. you had to do since you came home to you know try and secure your situation a little more? So again, like this was all in the process before the children were born, mm. before Theo was born. We engaged a lawyer, and our surrogate engaged a lawyer. Again, this is the great thing about using a surrogacy agency that they have all they 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 you employ these agencies because they know the law. Mm-hmm. So we had a lawyer right before Theo was born, and our surrogate had a lawyer. So immediately after Theo was born, the surrogate relinquished which is any rights to okay. the child. So, and then the G- DNS, DNA tests are done before the child or after the child's born so that immediately uh, the, 
like by law, it's recognized who the biological father mm -hmm. is. So that meant when Thea was 10 days old, we had proved that one of us was the biological father, that we could take him back mm -hmm. into Ireland. Not without significant expense. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, yeah. like the first 10 days of Theo's life were, were a lot of, mm -hmm. like you're going to your GP visits, but um, you're going to the doctor making sure you're looking after a newborn baby, which is terrifying anyway. <laughs> but we had on top of that, we were going to like get his passport issued and then do DNA tests. So it was, it was a lot of, pressure mm -hmm. luckily Gavin is very good under okay. pressure <laughs> he, he thrives he's the organizer yeah. one yeah and then uh, you had to then apply for, for legal guardianship um, yeah. and I understand you had to kind of prove yourself yeah, in order to get that yeah exactly so um yeah it's just it's really like it's just it's almost abusive like mm -hmm. listening to Cathy there talking about sitting in the car like um, when her child is in hospital it's like we're being treated as second class citizens here yeah so legally where we are is that like we like so with, with Theo say for example uh, Gavin has is the genetic father so after Gavin has proved to uh, the course that he's the genetic father so Gavin now has sole custody of Theo okay. uh, similar to Cathy after two years I can uh, apply to be Theo's guardian but like I don't want to be Theo's guardian no. because I'm not his guardian like my, myself and Gavin were their parents from the of all the way through this mm -hmm. journey, myself and Gavin were very lucky. We were at the birth with our surrogate. We went through all the birth with her. I was the first person to hold Theo. He was on my chest doing skin to skin immediately after his born, he was born. I've changed millions of nappies. Mm -hmm. He cries out for me in the night. You know, I've like I'm his parent. And mm -hmm. at the moment, legally in Ireland, I'm nothing to him. Nothing. And is it true that you had to get references from people to prove that you were of yeah, good so standing? Like, when we were going to have our court case, um, which basically means that for Gavin to get sole custody, um, we have to show that Theo was, um, and for me to start the process of applying to guardianship, I had to go to like our, our GP and get a reference, our public health nurse. Now, thankfully, I engaged with the public health nurse, which I think is amazing in Ireland, mm -hmm. right from the beginning, uh, 24 hours after, th or within 24 hours of Theo arriving into the country, I was onto the public health nurse. They so visited she was me. able to vouch for you? They visited me the next day. I have a great relationship mm -hmm. with them. He's like, and he, he's, vis he's reached all his milestones. But yeah, like they had to write a letter saying he'd reached all his milestones. And it's just like, thankfully he's reaching all his milestones. Imagine if like, to no fault of our own, we had had a child who wasn't reaching their milestones. But yeah, like I was standing in pennies one day shopping for uh, Theo and Lily and the phone rang and it was the solicitor saying like, I needed to get a, a reference from the, your GP and um, the public health nurse. And is there anyone else do you think that could say that you're a good dad? Wow. Like, oh. Meanwhile, there's this woman beside me screaming at her child, you don't sit down there, I'm gonna kill you. And I'm like, she's allowed to have, she has full rights to her child and I have to go around saying, to get like uh, begging people to write, well not begging people, but getting people yeah. to write a reference. And again, it's just t making me feel like, it's like uh, yeah, it's humiliating. It is, humiliating. it is humiliating. And again, it goes back to like, you know, being a gay man in this country had, well, has, was quite difficult. You know, I'm 42 now and I spent a lot of my years like living with shame of being mm -hmm. a gay man. And it just makes me feel that shame again, yeah. it, like that I have to like beg for equality. Absolutely. It's just completely, it's it's not on at all. When you when you put it like that, that you have to prove that you're worthy of being the father that you already are. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's absolutely outrageous. Renee, I'm going to go to you. Uh, your situation is very different again. Um, you and your wife brought your two lovely daughters into the world via donor assisted conception. Mm -hmm. So tell us your story in brief. Yeah, so my, my story is very different uh, to Cathy and Brendan, but also very similar. Yeah. Um, um, and similar to Brandon, I suppose, our kind of journey to becoming parents very much started out of place of um, hope and love. There, you know, there were, the, the, the slate was blank, I guess, when we started. Um, we, um, so we have been together for 13 years. Wow. And I think about three or four weeks, no, I'm probably exaggerating <laughs> this, but about three or four weeks into like dating, we were already talking about kids. Like wow. we, we were talking about kids from day one. We so both, you didn't rush into this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we spent a lot of years planning and figuring out how it would all work and, and what route we would go. Um, but but early on, I think we we had decided that we wanted to try to have a biological child, mm -hmm. whatever way that, that, that looked for us. And obviously there would have to be a donor involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, because for most LGBTQ plus people, there has to be a donor mm -hmm. involved and often there has to be a surrogate involved as well. So for us, we kind of knew that probably one of us could carry and that we would use a donor. 
that's as far as we had gotten. And then when we were really serious about it, it, it was 2015, it was the year of the marriage referendum, and it was just a time of hope and joy and possibility. And we never thought we were even going to get married, you know, because we had been dating for a long time and we didn't know there was going to be a referendum. We didn't know that that would be a possibility for us. So when we were like, oh, we're actually going to be able to get married here because we always said we're not going to go to a different country to get married. Mm -hmm. That's not for us. If we're, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it at home. But when we knew we could get married, we we're like, OK, this seems like the perfect time to start trying for a baby. And we were ready. So that summer, just after the yes vote, we went to a fertility clinic in Ireland and um, we had come up with this crazy idea that we would use Audrey's eggs and I would carry because when we were talking about it um, you know just for us we kind of felt like wouldn't it be great if we could both really be physically connected to this process mm -hmm. um, and we were lucky that we were in a position that we could we both had uteruses we both had like ovaries and eggs <laughs> you know so we're like can we kind of you know yeah. Um, share this. Email. Yeah, 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 just lucky in that sense. And so both of your daughters were born. You carried them Yeah, I carried with both Audrey's of them eggs. with Audrey's eggs. So Amazing. both of them are biologically her kids. Yeah. Um, they are the absolute spit of her. They really are. They are. Um, but I I grew them both, you know. So therefore, you're I'm the mother. I'm the birth, I'm the birth mother. And so. in Irish law, yeah. Audrey not so much until recently. Yeah, so so what happened was, yes, we'd gone through that process. We went to the clinic here and we actually found out we couldn't access that treatment in Ireland. So we were forced abroad, um, like many couples have been over the years and people Why over the years. Why is that not available here? Um, it is now. Is it reciprocal? It is now, okay. yeah. Yeah, so it's only been available since 2019. Okay. So we started having kids in 2015. So we were ahead ahead of that. Mm -hmm. And we felt really strongly it was what we wanted to do. So we decided to go abroad. We found ourselves in Spain in um, late 2015. We spent a month on what we call it, like baby making holiday. Mm -hmm. we, Sounds good to me. <laughs> we spent our money, you know, renting a renting a villa and just going through that reciprocal IVF process, collect, collecting Audrey's eggs, creating embryos and then having an embryo transfer. Um, it wasn't quite straightforward for us. Um, there was an early loss, but very lucky that it wasn't a very long process and that by November of that year, I was pregnant with our first daughter, Ava. Um, so Ava was born in um, August of 2016. Um, we got married in 2016, so I was pregnant when we got married. And um, I suppose right up until she was born, we were just living in this bubble of everything's fine now. Mm. Um, we, we kind of had thought, well, maybe it might be a bit more complicated because we're both women and because it was a donor assisted conception, but it would be fine because we're married. And under Irish law, all marriages are now equal. Mm -hmm. So surely, like any children born within our marriage, We'll have both of us as parents. Maybe so we'll you, have to sign some extra documents. No, we have no idea. Issue. Yeah, well, it's a fair assumption to make, isn't of it? Of course, and there are still people living under that assumption. Mm -hmm. um, so we only found out, like, you know, maybe a month before she was born, just how bad our situation was. That must have been devastating. It was for Audrey to think that these are her eggs. Mm. Her wife carried this beautiful child, and suddenly she's not considered yeah. to be a mother. Yeah, it was devastating, and you know. You know, just contented with being a new parent, anyways, and yeah. going through it wasn't the easiest of um, pregnancies or births. Mm -hmm. And then being faced with this really stark reality on the day that your child is born mm. that I am a single parent. Yeah. And that was my thought over and over I am a single parent. Um, here is my wife, it's her child, and she is nothing mm -hmm. in the eyes of the law to, to our child. And, um, one of the worst days of my life was going into Lombard Street in Dublin, registering her birth. And the two of us going in there and sitting there with all these other happy parents. For most people, you know, who maybe conceive their kids in a more traditional sense, they would quote that as one of the happiest days of their lives, up there with the birth of their children and their wedding and getting at their house, you know. But for us, that was one of the worst days of our lives. It was just really bleak. And so you had to register yourself as a single parent that day? Yes, and okay. the registrar wouldn't even speak to Audrey. She asked which one of us was the mother. And, you know, we said, well, we both are. And she said, well, which one gave birth? And I said, I did. And she said, well, Renee, I'll be directing all my questions to you. Okay. And she did not address Audrey from that point on. And 
um, it made a really bad day even worse. Mm -hmm. And it was it was just it was awful. We left and it was like we didn't even we didn't even have anything to say to each other after that. We're like, what can you say? That's so destroying. You know, Absolutely, just yeah. being treated. It's you know, it's like in t 2015 when we got at marriage equality, we thought we were equal, and then it's just realizations like this that we still, as as people in same-sex relationships, are being discriminated against. After Absolutely. fighting so hard in the first place yeah. to to get marriage equality and to be able to do that and to be able to to be recognised as a unit legally, to then not be able to be recognised as a family unit. Yeah. yeah. It just, no, I'm sure it, you, it makes brings back that shame that you're in a relationship that people don't agree with. It's mm -hmm. just, it's and it's horrible. it's worse because you know it's one thing when it, it's it's you being discriminated against, yeah. but when it's your kids, yeah. you know, and it's yeah. your kids are being punished because of how they were born, how they were conceived, where they were born, or the sex of their parents, and it's um, it's so much worse. It's yeah. you know, it's one thing as an adult to kind of contend with discrimination or inequality, but when your children are being subjected to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's not on. Yeah. So things have changed for you in recent years because of an act and because of, you know, because you are a female um, same sex couple. Because so tell us a little bit about that. Way. So I suppose things have changed and um, people watching this maybe have seen kind of news headlines. Um, a piece of legislation was enacted last year in 2020. It actually was passed in 2015 ahead of the marriage referendum, but um, it was delayed by five years before it was actually enacted. So this piece of legislation is called the Children and Family Relationships Act, and it provides for certain people who have conceived children uh, through donor-assisted conception in a particular way to both be registered as their child's parents. So this means if you're a female couple who has used a donor to conceive through a fertility clinic and your child is born in Ireland, um, you can both be registered as your um, child's parents. That seems like a very narrow mm -hmm. window in the, you know, the big diagram yes. of all the types of people it who is. are affected by <laughs> this. <laughs> really? Yes. It is. Um, you know, so in, in a sense, it's, a, it's absolutely a step forward and it was a welcome step for many families who were covered by it. Um, but it's n nowhere near where we need it to be. Um, and it, it gets even a bit more complicated because those who conceived before this act came in, if you used a foreign clinic and if you used an anonymous donor, say, but as, as long as your child was still born in Ireland to a female same sex couple, you can go to court, have something that's called a declaration of parentage mm -hmm. and you can apply for a new birth cert for your child. However, after that law came in, it has to be an Irish clinic. It has to be an identifiable sperm donor and your child still has to be born in Ireland. So in our case, you know, we've been fighting this for years and finally when this when this act came in, um, we knew we would be covered for our children who exist here now. Because of the because date that they were born. the date they yeah. were born and conceived. So they were conceived prior to this law coming mm. in, in a foreign clinic. Um, so we actually were only in court about a month ago and we finally had our day in court where we, we got a declaration of parentage telling us what we've already known for over six years. Um, that Audrey is the parent of both of our, our daughters. Um, we, we're waiting for their new birth certs to be sent to us, but we still have embryos in our clinic that we are planning to use. Mm -hmm. We are going to be back in the same situation where Audrey is not recognized as a parent to those children if we're lucky enough to conceive. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. And it just shows how arbitrary a lot of these um, laws are and how yeah, narrow very, and very narrow. they don't take into account the reality mm -hmm. of families and parents and children in Ireland. Uh, and far from future proof completely. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I suppose what, what needs to happen? It's taken so long for that mm -hmm. small step forward. But obviously, this is a much broader issue, you know, with donor assist conception and then obviously surrogacy that happens abroad. And obviously the two often very often go hand in hand. But what needs to happen now, Cathy? Well, I suppose we've we've been waiting a very long time as as a country, as a society. So the first um, commission on assisted human reproduction was back in the year two thousand. Okay, it's twenty one years ago. Wow. Commissioned by Miha Martin, who was now now Taoiseach, who was her then minister for health. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so twenty one years. So we we actually have children who who are that age. You know, so they've they've lost the chance to have a legal relationship That's with really, their parents. Yeah, it puts um, perspective. And and you know, and for them, even in, in terms of inheritance and things like that, there's lots of add on mm -hmm. complications. And for you'd it. imagine there might have been, you know, deaths that affected people really badly over that time as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what is the delay? Why is this not priority? So I suppose that's the million dollar question. What is the delay? Um, when when we're working with the government and and the government have been engaging with mm -hmm. us, but I think. 
the point that we're at now is there's been special committees set up, there's been commissions done, there's been reports done. Mm -hmm. All of this has been done, but there's still a delay. Um, and for us, I suppose the people who are living the lived experience of having children um, through surrogacy and assisted human reproduction, enough is enough. You know, the time yeah. the time has come to finally get this sorted. Um, we're really, really hopeful that this is going to happen, mm -hmm. that they're going to listen to the voices of our children. Mm -hmm. I suppose the one thing that we really try and get across when we're meeting the politicians. This isn't about us. No. You know, none of us need a piece of paper to tell us that we're the parents to our children. We live that experience every day. This is about our children and their rights. Um, and I suppose for them to be the same as every other child in Ireland. Um, and so what we what we're hoping is going to happen is we've been told by the government that there is another committee starting in January, starting okay. in January, be four months. Yeah, and that there's it's a time specific committee that will be four months um, to look at the issues of international surrogacy. Now, we understand that, you know, as a concept and it, it is a complex issue. We understand that. But I suppose it's not good enough for them to tell us that it's a complex issue. There are legislators. Mm -hmm. We've done this before in lots of other areas. Yeah. They need to find a way through this. Um, and it's not as though we're the first country doing it. No. 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 England, 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 England had their first legislation in 1985. 1985, wow. yeah. So they're, re they're renewing mm -hmm. and reviewing their surrogacy laws. Yeah. But the point is they have them, you know, to review mm -hmm. and renew. We, we don't even have that. No. And um, we've seen in the last couple of years how quickly things can happen when they need to. So mm -hmm. it's a case of making this our government's priority. Um, you People listening to this, how can they add their voices to it and maybe help you guys put pressure on because I know this isn't going to come to a referendum. It's not like people can vote on it. So how do um, how do we, you know, make our voices heard? How do we give I them the push that's going yeah, to if, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if anybody thinks that it is an injustice, what's happening to our kids and, and the way that they're being treated and our families um, uh, in, in society in Ireland today, then the number one thing that we need them to do is to make sure that their representatives are made aware of that. Mm -hmm. So they need to email their politicians. They need to email their politicians. Mm -hmm. They need to contact their local clinics. Um, they need to talk to the politicians, even if they don't think that it affects them right now. Going forward in the future, this will affect every single family in Ireland Absolutely. in some way. This could be anybody's child. It could be anybody's brother, anybody's sister. This isn't just a small group of people who right now are affected. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Um, and if the, the people don't tell the government that actually this is not fair, it's, it's not justice, no. it's not fair, it's, it's, not, it's not equal. No. Uh, as Renee would say, until we're all equal, no, no, no one is. Uh, that's it. Equality um, is such a universal issue. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it, it needs to be across the board or else we're all vulnerable mm -hmm. because you never know what's going to happen with you, with your kids, with yeah. future generations. So, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's our number one thing is that, you know, and this doesn't just even affect the small nuclear family. You know, we all have like, um, you know, families, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all of those people aren't recognised. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it, it's a it's a major thing. Yeah. And I suppose the call to action that we would have for people um, collectively is is that people let their politicians know that this is not the Ireland that we want to live in. No. This is not the Ireland we want for our children. Um, and, and, and that's the number one thing really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, as a nation, we've proven it time and time again, when we put our backs into something, we're very good at affecting mm -hmm. change, but we need to shout and stomp our feet for anything to get done. <laughs> It's, it's been the way across the board. So I guess we just need people to really get on board and just get behind the campaign, go to the marches, sign the peti petitions, mm -hmm. volunteer with the organisations. I think it's really important that we're having conversations like mm -hmm. this because I think there are still so many people in Ireland who would 100% get behind this, but they don't know about no. it. Mm -hmm. So it's so important that for anyone watching this, that they do share it, mm -hmm. that they do talk about it, that they that they make sure that their entire circle knows and is, is supporting this because um, it, you know, it's on all of us. It's it, it's it's not just on one person no. to fix this. Mm -hmm. We need to fix this collectively. Yeah. And we need to harass our politicians on our doorsteps. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it needs to be a priority. It needs to be, you know, we talk about housing, we talk about health. This mm -hmm. needs to be on everyone's tongue when they're talking about the issues yeah. around this country, yeah. for sure. And the assisted human reproduction bill is coming forward. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's been a long time coming, but it is actually coming forward now. Um, yeah, so I guess the trouble with what they've proposed in the past is that it just hasn't been realistic. What they've proposed in the past wouldn't have covered any any of these families okay. um, or like 99.9% .9 mm -hmm. of children that exist. Yeah. Um, the, the legislation they've been talking about is really about theoretical 
you know, processes and theoretical mm -hmm. children, but it wouldn't actually reflect the reality mm -hmm. of how our families are formed. Yeah. So really um, what, what we need is to make sure that the bill they do bring forward mm -hmm is appropriate for what we need and for what our children need. And I think what, what's really important to note is that we need to, before we legislate for theoretical children, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that the children that exist are protected. And that doesn't need to be tied up. That doesn't need to be part of the same process. Those children could be protected before we get the AHR bill. Mm -hmm. There could be a process by which any child who exists through surrogacy or donor-assisted conception there's a pathway for their unrecognized parent to get a parental order and to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And that is urgent. Yeah. That is not something that needs to be uh, discussed and in debated a, and another committee, committee. And, and another representative. Um, um, you know, we've, we've had a, a really important report in the last year by the Special Rapporteur for Children, Professor Conor O'Mahony. He did a very in-depth um, piece of research into this area of assisted human reproduction. He spent a year compiling a report and writing recommendations. And his recommendations are very clearly mm -hmm. that all children from a children's rights point of view need to have a legal connection to their parents mm -hmm. who love and care for them on a daily basis. So we need to sort it out. So hopefully that's uh, the, his findings are what the government are going to use to move forward with this. That's what well, we would hope. That's what we yeah. would. We, okay. I mean, yeah. Can't. Well, look, groups like yours are doing amazing work, um, not just for your families, but for everyone. Um, and we all thank you for that. But if there's anyone watching this and they're thinking about going down the surrogacy route, just, I mean, briefly, what would you say? What's, what's your best advice from, if, from the start? If, you know, given that they may be going into a slightly vulnerable position as it stands, yeah, I suppose. I mean, for me, one of the things that I say all the time for anybody who, who might be thinking about it or going forward is, yes, there's all this stuff going on in the background. But right now, you have people like us to do the advocating for sure. that. Right now, think about your family and think about your children. Um, I suppose when I you know, look at Ted and Elsie, I don't see a child that was born through donor egg no. or a child who was carried by an amazing surrogate. I see my beautiful children. I see their, you know, unique personalities and their innocent souls. And when I look at myself through their eyes, reflected back at me is their mammy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the one thing that keeps me going. And I think for anybody else, you know, going into this now, just Think about that. Think about the children who will look back at you and whether a piece of paper says it or not, they will look at you as your daddy or your mommy, as their daddy or their mommy, because yeah. that's what you are. And I suppose when when you have that, the fire in your belly, the mama bear and the papa bear will come out and yeah. you will fight to make sure that your children are equal. Indeed. I mean, you shouldn't have to, but, but absolutely so. Yeah, it's worth it, even though it's difficult, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Guys, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. I think, as Renee said, you know, people probably aren't aware that this is happening. So it's really important for you to kind of, you know, let people know. And hopefully everyone at home will really kind of get behind the campaign and stomp and shout, as Irish people are known to do when we get behind a cause. So I think that's all we have time for. Join us next week when we'll be talking about something completely different. We're going to ask, are we spoiling our kids at Christmas? And is Christmas putting a lot of pressure on Irish families? We'll talk to you then.